Hello and welcome to FinTech Impact. I'm your host, Jason Pereira. Today on the show, I have John Bromley and Michael Todd of Charitable Impact. Charitable Impact is a FinTech online platform that enables charitable donations through donor advised funds. So I brought them on the show to talk about how they're doing that and what a donor advised fund is exactly. And with that, here's my interview with the gentleman from Charitable Impact. Hello, gentlemen. Hi. Hey, Jason. Thanks for taking the time today. Thanks for having us. So John Bromley and Michael Todd of Charitable Impact or CHIMP, as we affectionately call you, tell us about Charitable Impact. Yeah. So Jason, Charitable Impact, you know, asks the questions, who's really there to support the donor who's looking to participate and or is participating in charitable giving and who's there to support them regardless of what causes or charities they care about, regardless of how much money they have, regardless of how much experience they have with charitable giving. And so we're here to support them kind of like a bank-like structure. We give people their own individual giving account. It's what's referred to as a donor advised fund. And they take on that account. They can put their charitable donations into it. They're tax receipted immediately. They can then send that when they're ready to the charity or charities they choose to support. And we're there along the way to help them with any questions and concerns they have. Okay, excellent. So tell me about the uh, creation of this company. What was the impetus for its establishment? Well, the that would go back. I'd, I'd say there's sort of two things that I was thinking about at the time I started Charitable Impact. The first was, where do you go to get objective advice? Where do you go to get objective advice with the charitable giving world, particularly for the everyday donor? So that was one of the questions. The other question was, if you're ever to make charitable giving an option in any economic transaction, how does that happen fluidly and in, on a cost-effective basis where the person who's transacting gets to choose what happens with the charitable dollars? And the answer to both of those questions ended up being the same type of approach to charitable giving, which is the donor advised fund. So the donor advised fund allows a neutral giving account that's uh, focused on the donor that enables us and, and, and other people uh, who, who advise on financial matters to help the donor, regardless of what they care about from a charity perspective. Of course, in a country like Canada, there's 85,000 plus charities. So separating the donation from where the money's going to go is actually a really important and interesting thing. And at the same level, when you think about how you enter a charitable transaction into any economic transaction, I mean, let's say you're selling your old Air Jordans on eBay and you want to have some of those go to have some of that money or all of it go to charity. How would you interface that between an eBay or a merchant and the consumer in a way that respects what the consumer wants to support charitably? The answer to that was also donor advised fund. So at the end of the day, we developed a donor advised fund built strongly on technology. And uh, we are, as a result, we consider ourselves an act as a fintech organization, but strictly focused on the world of charitable giving. Yeah. So 85,000 charities. I mean, as you guys saw, but no one on the podcast's audio saw, I very much shook my head and saying, what? For a country of 37 million people, that's a little over 435 people per charity. Right? So, uh, man, I know there's a lot of competition in the charitable space. I did not realize it was that intense. So for the benefit of the listeners, uh, let's talk about donor advised funds. What is a donor advised fund and how does it function? So I'll, I'll take this, Jason. The, there's two ways I, I talk about what a donor advised fund is as an analogous scenario. So the first is it's, it's kind of like having a bank account for charitable giving. Okay, so what's a bank account? It's an account structure that you have with an organization called a bank who does all the administration and support for the user. So a donor advised fund is very much analogous to a bank account, except it's strictly for charitable giving purposes. Once money is in the donor advised fund, it can only leave the donor advised fund to go to another registered charity or what uh, is called uh, referred to as a qualified donee. So what it's also like as an analogy, if people are familiar with the private foundation, a private foundation is used oftentimes by wealthy families and or corporations to sort of manage and control their charitable giving. So a donor advised fund is also analogous to a really accessible or democratized version of a private foundation. And at Charitable Impact, we provide a donor advised fund to everybody who wants one, regardless of how much money they have. To give you some sense, 
We have accounts that are north of $70 million uh, in terms of their value to the donor advised fund. And yet both of my boys who are seven and nine years old have donor advised funds that have very, very small down balances because their dad pays them a charitable allowance every month and they use that account to give it away. Fairness, you're a little biased. <laughs> anyway, so that said, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm familiar with these because I've been using them for a while. So, I mean, and then the other piece of this is that this is a highly effective way of basically donating money, having discretion over this account uh, in terms of where it goes on an annual basis. We can go over the mechanics shortly, but also kind of outsourcing the work, more or less, in a highly effective and affordable way. So let's talk about the entire life cycle of this. I decide I'm going to give money to charity. I'm going to, I choose a donor advised fund. How does the donor advised fund work? Well, the donor advised fund, again, works a little bit like a bank account for charity. So you would put the money into that account. You know, the question you'd be asking yourself as a donor is what asset type am I going to give at charitable impact? We can take money off a credit card or or cash off of, off a check. You can take you can give publicly traded securities, you can give real estate, you can give private company shares. So one yep. question is what type of asset are you going to give? Then that asset gets donated. And as soon as it crosses the border into the donor advice fund, you're issued a tax receipt immediately. That's the point in time when the gift, the charitable gift at law takes place. And so with the donor advice fund, those assets are put into an account that you can manage as a donor. And that donation decision is therefore separate from the decisions that go into which charities you want to support, how much money you want to give those charities, when, why, how, etc. So the, the donor advice fund acts as the intermediary between the donor and the eventual charities that the donors choose to support. But every year there's an obligation to make a distribution out of that towards that. So yeah, so it's the same, yeah, we go like a large endowed foundation only for people at any level. Okay. Yeah. So, so Jason, so, that, that's a really important point you just make. Then, so let's just clarify that. Once you make a, a, a donation to your donor advised fund, the obligation for the donor advised fund foundation is that at minimum of three and a half percent of the assets that come in are distributed to charities. Mm-hmm. And so, at Charitable Impact, the way we approach that is to have each donor advised fund send out at least three and a half percent, you know, of the donations they make into it out the door to charities. However, what we find is that the vast majority of donor advised funds in our donor advised fund at Charitable Impact, the percentage going out is way beyond that 3.5% minimum, which is regulated by the Canada Revenue Agency. I get that because, I mean, here's the thing, like they're giving money to be charitable. It's sitting there in an account. They'd rather see that go to use. So let's talk about the motivations for why people would utilize a donor advised funds as opposed to direct donation. Like what are the advantages to doing so? And I'll open that up to either one of you. Well, I'll start and Mike can add how, how it really, you know, works, you know, for people who have larger balances that they're looking to, you know, larger donations that they're using to make. I think the core benefit is the ability to separate the donation from which charities you want to go. So the, the, that core benefit allows you to sort of to plan and budget your charitable giving. You can make a commitment to charity and say, for example, you know, I want to make, I want to be involved in this charitable giving thing. I'm going to give $100 away every month and I'm just going to commit that now. I'm going to make a recurring automated donation off my credit card, for example, into my donor advised fund. And I'm going to then just have that money go in there and I'm going to stop and think with a separate part of you know my brain and my heart with regard to where that money is going to go. So it allows you to separate that the donation from the, the grant making to the charities. That enables you to budget better. All of your charitable giving is going through one centralized account. So you'll always know what you've done, both on the donation side and on the grant making side particularly with an organization like ours, because we're automated, we can tell you exactly when and where and why maybe you even sent your charitable donations. So there's a huge administrative and tracking and budgeting benefit. And where we see this playing out is sort of twofold. One is with the donors who want to get involved with charitable giving, but don't really know yet which charities or causes they care about. So many people come and talk to us and say, look, I For example, recently, I want to help stuff related to COVID-19 in my city. I want to donate. I'm prepared to donate, but I don't know exactly where it's going to go. The donor advice fund, and that gives them the time and space to manage that. The other type of major client we we see, the other type of audience that that Mike Todd deals with um, is people who know know 
that they want to be involved in charitable giving, but they're giving larger amounts away and they want to be able to plan that gift and involve their financial advisors in the planning of that gift. And then these people are often not giving cash. They're often giving other types of non-cash assets. And mm -hmm. these people put larger donations in and then we allow them not just to manage that, to, but to make investments uh, with that money that they've donated. I think just to, just to build off John's answer to it and, and taking everything he said and then taking it into my world, which is working with financial advisors and their clients. Yeah, let me add to that and just build off of what John said in my world, which is working with financial advisors and their clients who want to donate securities. There are several uh, practical or even financial reasons that they'll want to do it. We're starting with the premise that they're, they're charitably minded. They're going to give away money anyway. So let's do it uh, wisely and efficiently. And quite honestly, one of, the, one of the simple reasons not to be overlooked is the fact that they have the asset now. It's in hand. Perhaps the stock is up, especially these days with these markets, you never know. So they, they want to lock that in now. So they're going to donate now because it's, it's valuable. They're not sure what they're going to do with the money or they're going to give it away in future years. doesn't matter. They're going to lock it in now. So that, that's not to be overlooked. A lot of folks we deal with are, are looking at a liquidity event, which is the term I use for any sort of thing where let's say they're going to sell their company, the executive has exercised his options or got a large bonus. They're going to give away money, as I said, but they're also facing a tax bill. So let's give away a, a sizable amount of assets today. Get that tax receipt and let's, let's, not be, uh, let's not be embarrassed about that. Get that tax receipt, utilize it as part of the financial plan, and then have those assets to give away in the future. Um, yeah. What would confront it with paying the government or paying a charity? Most people will opt for the latter. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And we get to, uh, not only do we get the tax receipt, as you know, but we get to eliminate any capital gains on those assets. Hopefully there's still mm -hmm. some capital gains out there these, these days. And another simple reason or, or a corollary to that would be clients I know, and these are cases I've dealt with where they're quite generous. They're giving away, let's pick a number, $50,000 a year to charity. And they've had this liquidity event or other circumstance. So let's take 500,000 as an example, put it into the donor advised fund and literally pre-fund their giving for the next decade and take advantage of that, uh, that mm -hmm. structure now. So there are a lot of heartfelt reasons why people give and, and those are really the bedrock. And then we can build on that and, and choose financially wise timing and, and reasons as well. Yeah, and as one of the people you deal with as a financial advisor, uh, I would say that there are a couple other things that come to mind. Um, sometimes, especially with larger cases, time. Right, like I can get something like you set up very quickly. If I wanted to set up a private foundation, you better have a significant runway before the end of the year. Otherwise, you're not going to get authorization from CRA to get that done. Whereas you can start off as a as a donor advised fund and then roll over to a formal a formal foundation later on if that's you know, if that's your behest. And then one of the other things I talk to in general to clients about, you know, when they talk about teaching their kids and about financial literacy and and about responsibility, you know, we talk around the concept of charity and it's giving money. Letting them, if they want charity to be a part of that child's learning in that life, then being able to sit them down and have them say, okay, we have this much money to distribute this year. Where do we want it to go to? And having a conversation around that. And even, you know, I've even seen some cases where, you know, having them research how the money is used, getting them some level of responsibility over that action is a great way of treating the, teaching them not only financial literacy and responsibility with financial literacy, but decision points around it and just basically benevolence altogether. So it's um, it's a powerful tool of use properly. So in general, what do you, okay, so I know you're, you're largely dealing with a lot of financial advisors, but uh, what's the mix? Like how many people come to you directly and how many people basically are, are being referred through other sources? It's a great question. And it's, a, it's an interesting time for the question as well, because I do think that knowledge of donor advised funds in Canada is, I'll say low, but it is on the increase. So at this point in time, in my world, and, I, and it's, it's not speaking to all the donors that we have a charitable impact, but in my world, more often than not, the financial advisor is looking for a, uh, an, a solution for their charitably minded clients. So they'll, they'll come to us and, and, and ask what our service is like. Sometimes the client has pressed for that and sometimes they haven't. But occasionally we hear from people who say, listen, I know what you guys are all about. I'm wondering about securities. Uh, how does that work? And then we can we can either pass them back to their advisor or introduce them to someone if they're if they're not working with anybody at the moment. But at this point in time, and I'm biased, of course, because I spend all day talking to advisors, but I see most of the inquiries coming through them. Yeah, well, I mean, the good advisors they realize that their job is get clients what they want out of life, and if charity is part of that, then basically being able to account for that is is definitely part of it. There is an inherent conflict there. I mean, the you know, you're, you're telling clients to give away money you're making money off of, but I've always had a belief that clients aren't idiots, and if you're not looking out for their best interest, they're going to find someone else who is. 
Well, Jason, I'll just add a couple of things. Just on your last comment, I mean, we see that conflict that you're referring to, and our approach to that is to address it while building off it as an advantage. So when we work with a financial advisor, if they're an investment manager in particular, and their client wants to retain assets with that advisor, we enable them to do that. And as a result, we work with somewhere close right now to 100 different investment managers across different firms. Usually we see that as a benefit to the client because they already have a trusting relationship with this advisor and the advisor wants to retain these assets in a way that they can look at the entire portfolio of the client across their entire asset base. So the other thing I was going to just say when you, you, you asked us, you know, where our clients come from. So we have higher net worth donors and we generally meet those people through the majority of those people we meet through working with financial advisors. The majority of our donors, however, are ordinary Canadians, everyday Canadians, I refer to as grassroots donors. And these people, generally speaking, come to us directly. Because we're a financially based donor advised fund, you know, effectively a fintech in this space, compared to other donor advised funds, I mean, we have many, 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 many donor advised funds. So let's call it 100,000 donor advised funds. 90 plus percent of those are going to be from ordinary grassroots donors who are using a donor advice fund with us to give $50, $100, $150 away a month, for example. So the majority of our users are grassroots Canadians. However, the majority of our assets under management, which are about $250 million right now, are from a very slim minority of clients that we're working with. On It's the 80-20 rule on everything, right? So it's the, so it's the 80-20 yeah. or the 90-10 rule here, which, you know, you'd see in any type of financial institution and it, and it applies also through to the donor advised fund. You asked a couple of questions specific around the technology. I mean, you know, I've dealt with donor advised funds in the past and there's typically minimum thresholds. You'll see more you know, trust companies put up like hundred thousand dollar minimum thresholds. You'll see some other players put up 25,000 thresholds. You're basically saying you can do this with just about any amount more or less. Clearly that's digitally enabled. So tell me how the technology aspect of this works. Like what is it doing for the, for, for the consumer, what is it doing for you and what is it doing to enable you to handle this many number of accounts? Most importantly, the, you know, those three is what's it, what's it doing for the donor? For the donor, with the donor advice fund, when it's technologically oriented, we have a web-based platform and we also have launched an iOS, a native iOS app, and we're working on our, on our Android app. The purpose of this is to say, look, and, and you, you introduced us as Charitable Impact, who you know affectionately as CHIMP. So CHIMP actually stands for Charitable Impact, but it also stands yep. for Charity in My Pocket. So where you have your, your charity in your pocket, the, the advantage of the donor is just, look, when you're out and about, if you're doing something, you're thinking something charitably, you can now act where you are, whether you're at the fundraiser, whether you're around a, con- whether you're around a table with your family making decisions or whether you've just interacted on something that's caused you to want to make a donation. So the, the, the main advantage is for the donor there. The, the, the application is with them all the time. They can be charitable in the moment, whether that's planned or, or inspiration-based. Of course, the tracking of what you've done, when you've done it, is, is also really important. So for the donor, that's our main focus. We like to be technology-oriented because the benefit is to the user. Of course, however, it's also scalable. So a donor advised fund is a donor advised fund is a donor advised fund. What makes a donor advised fund different from a donor's perspective is how they use it. So it makes no difference to us whether we start one donor advised fund in a day or a thousand. They love to regret those words. I, I always love when te- I always love when scale testing happens and like, oh my God, we're getting crushed. There, there is a threshold where even technology breaks, my friend. Um, well, that, 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 that's a fair point. That's a fair point. Yeah. Uh, but ju- just to go back to the original question, so like on a missional basis, if you want to be charitable, thank you. P- please get in- involved. And so it shouldn't yeah. matter if your mission is to in- enable people to be charitable. It, it shouldn't matter how much money you have to give away. So the technology being scalable allows us to be truly missional, but also differentiate ourselves from other uh, organizations that run donor advice funds by having no minimums. So I made the point earlier, and you were referring to working with kids on philanthropy. I mean, my kids are under the ages of 10, and they both have donor advised funds, you know, coming from a family of like mine, which is sort of middle class. They're not sitting on massive charitable assets. They're just earning a charitable allowance every month. So we're able to deal with that type of scale. And as a result, where I think this gets interesting down the road is we build more community-oriented social networking features into the donor advised fund. It allows the donor advice fund to look like a charitable microcosm of the economy in general, where you have, Mm -hmm. where you have, you know, uh, higher net worth people who are, you know, fewer and farther between, but control more assets. 
engage with the average Canadian, who, who, of which there are many. And so you get the hearts and minds and the masses uh, partnered up with the larger donors. And I think you see great efficiencies come about, not just on cost efficiency, but also on missional, missional efficiencies. Awesome. I mean, and I would also think that your onboarding has to be a lot easier. So how long does it take me from start to finish? You have the account open and funded. If you can remember your email address, you can get signed up with your impact account, uh, which is your donor advised fund in two minutes. And if you're going to use a credit card, cash donation is probably the fastest way. That'll probably take you another minute or two. And so, you know, you're, you're set up with a donor advised fund in five minutes or less. If you're going to make a more complicated donation of non-cash assets, that might add another half an hour to an hour if you need to talk to your uh, financial advisor. But our systems are, are such that you can do it quickly and you can act. And so the majority of your time goes into what you're trying to do and why you're trying to do it. And Charitable Impact takes care of all the how it happens. So I'm curious, um, with the advisors you've been dealing with in general, so I'm sure many of them have used charitable solutions in the past. What's their response to your solution in comparison to what they've used in the past? Yeah, I can speak to that. It's uh, it's an interesting one. And to back up one, one step, and Jason, I know you know this, it's interesting for me because I'll say the majority of advisors I speak to, uh, their knowledge level is still not quite there yet. So you run into people who don't know what a donor advised fund is. And so a lot of time is spent on education. And then you run into the ones who do. And then it simply becomes, okay, tell me about yours and why should I be working with you as opposed to X, Y, Z? And that's, that's, a, that's a great conversation to have as well. In our case, we uh, simplify the administration for the advisor greatly. I know of other donor advice funds that advisors are using and they're telling me that, listen, we're calling charities, we're confirming addresses, we're cutting checks and putting them in the mail, et cetera. And it's adding to my team's administrative burden greatly. And it's, it's a frustration for them. In our case, we all do what we're good at. So I'm sure John won't, won't mind me saying this. We're lousy money managers. That's why we get you to do it. We're the charity geeks and we want to do all the, of that admin and we want the advisors to manage the money. So with us, they're just doing what they're going to do anyway. They're managing assets and then passing it along to us to handle and work with the donor to get it to the charities of their choice. Very, very easy. And we do it at a, at a relatively low cost, which is always appreciated as well. So, and it's because of the technology. We allow the advisor to plug in We allow the advisor to add philanthropy to their shingle. And this is something else that I can help you with, but we're not adding to their their administrative burden, which as we all know is a good chunk of an advisor's day these days. Jason, the only thing I'd add to, to that is to summarize it by saying, we do, at Charitable Impact, we do nothing but philanthropy. We do nothing but charity. We do nothing but donor advised funds. And so we're not running a donor advised fund off the side of our desk or off the side of our institution. We are uh, built, purpose-based as a donor advised fund with a very strong focus on donors and the people that help them. And so people like us because of that focus, we don't intermingle anything. I think also financial advisors like us because we take so much work off their plate, all the administration, regardless of what charities their their clients want to support is, is taken care of. And lastly, because we provide a huge amount of support both to their client and to them themselves, enabling them to build a philanthropic uh, service into their into in, into what they're doing. And so that support is really really strong at Charitable Impact. And and as a result, as Mike said, you know, plug in with them and uh, enable donors to do what they want to achieve in life, and the clients achieve what they want to try get done, while interacting with their existing financial advisors who aren't adding much if any workload to themselves because it's all being outsourced in terms of how it's getting done to us as their as their donor advice fund partner so uh, before we wrap up there's three questions i ask uh ask everyone and get you thinking so and i want both of you to answer individually first one is if you had one wish or something can change in your company or the industry as a whole what would it be Great question, Jason. So my, my answer is the biggest problem in the charity sector today is that there's really nowhere to learn about giving. So the one thing I would wish for is that our nature of generosity as humans had an environment in which it was nurtured so that people were just more educated about charitable giving, what it means to them and, and what it means to society. And so that you can get over the hurdle of what this is and, and just get to doing it. So my wish would be greater fluency, greater financial literacy around charitable giving. Now, whether that's pro or con, frankly, at this point, I would just wish for the greater fluency and rely on human generosity to make the hypothesis that most people are going to trend positively towards it. 
I'm going to cheat a little bit and um, take John's answer and, and also add to it. And I think financial literacy, and Jason, you may, you may agree here, it needs to be more of a topic of conversation. It needs to be more of an educational subject in schools. And an important element, I think, is of financial literacy in general would be philanthropy. Uh, we've all been raised in what uh, we like to refer to as a fundraising paradigm, where we're taught to give to charity X, Y, Z. But somebody's running or biking or doing something exactly. to do to yeah. beat something. Yeah. yeah. I want somebody to teach me to be a donor. And the immediate question is, well, who are you going to give it to? I don't know. doesn't matter. I'll teach me to be a donor. And so that's what I'm looking for. It's interesting. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to add to your comments, both of your comments. I'm going to add one other thing. So first off, my wish is that some of these regional governments that are unfortunately not uh, giving full credit for donation change their policies. And maybe that this country takes a viewpoint that they should be giving the biggest donations to the biggest charitable credits to charity and not to political donations. Thank you very much. Second piece is financial literacy. I have a more nuanced and more controversial view of it. And it came from thinking about something that was said by the founder of, um, of Betterment in the U.S., where he said financial literacy is BS. What you need is, is grid UX. And what I'm thinking yeah, is that basically it's financial literacy and understanding fundamentals of money and expenditure and like that. That's fine. But you also don't want to get the level where everybody can change their own oil, like on their car. It's not, it's not that level of literacy. What I want is systems engineered for the consumer to win and not for five to six major institutions to win every time. There's a thing, there's something called a dark pattern in, um, in programming where it's you make it hard to do the thing, a certain thing. So there's a dark pattern hiding that. And if you look at, if you just think of the entire fi financial system in Canada, I think banking is just a, one giant dark pattern, quite honestly. And then the last point you made about the charitable giving, as opposed to, you know, we're doing it to, to when someone's doing a fundraiser. One of the things I get back from clients a lot is what I'll call charitable fatigue. They'll give to this person at work here and that person at work there. And then, then that's crowding out so much of the other charity work that's happening. Or they'll do it when there's a lottery, which you don't realize is not really charity, that sort of stuff. I, I almost, I'd like to see a retrench, a refocusing of charity from being a just, oh, I got asked to, no, no, no. Like, let's, let's, let's take the center away from, from the other people and bring it to me and make it about what's important to me and my family and my and the causes I believe in. I think we'd be all much better off if we just all created our own sense of tithing towards the greater good. Jason, that's a phenomenal answer. You're hired. <laughs> the, 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 just really quick, if I can, because so the Donor Advice Fund empowers the donor to take control over their charitable giving. And instead of always yeah. reacting to the fundraiser, deciding to commit you know, a certain budget amount that just goes into charity and they commit that and they separate that donation, for that, that, yeah. that commitment from where it's going. So I think that that's one thing. I love uh, also really your point about user experience. You call it UX, about user experience is critical. Couldn't agree more. We believe that everyone in the world has something they want to create change for and they have something to give towards that. And that user experience that's built for the needs and wants of the person giving the money away is one of the biggest things missing in the charity sector today. User experience on a macro basis in Canada and countries like the United States is effectively driven through a fundraising paradigm, you know, where it's controlled by the charities who are constantly asking. And that then takes us full circle around to your point yeah. back, to, back to why I believe the Donor Advised Fund is such a critical tool today. I also wonder, maybe you guys have seen it. I, I, have, to, I have to actually, I wonder if, if it, the fundraising paradigm actually reduces total contributions altogether. Because I mean, the fatigue factor, right? You're doing these in micro amounts of like 50 bucks, 100 bucks, like, like if that, right? You're doing this in such small amounts that at the end of the year, I get this all the time, clients like, oh, I donate all the time. And then, you know, you pull their tax return and it's like, oh, you donated $250 in $25 increments, right? Like you got fatigued by it. But if you actually sat back and, and actually thought about how much do I want to give to something I care about, the number might have been significantly higher, right? So I almost feel like, and I've talked to charities about like the one, the winners in this race and the losers in this race, because the ones who have the large apparatuses to, to organize like four major events over the course of a year, right? Like the big inspirational, like I'm going to bike from here to God knows where, like those people do very well. It's everybody else that is basically like, we got, we got a three person staff. How are we supposed to? And they're getting crowded out of the entire equation, right? So it's- Can, I, can I give you some data on those points? Just yeah, real, go for it. So, yeah. so you go back 15 years in Canada. So we're in 2020 now. You go back 15, 20 years and approximately just under 30% of Canadians made donations and claimed that on their income tax. Today, 15, 20 years later, that number's closer to 20% of Canadians doing that. 
at over the same period, the amount of money that charities have spent on fundraising has increased dramatically. So what you're suggesting yeah. in the hypothesis is actually true when you look at the macro data, which is that the more charities are spending on fundraising, fatiguing donors in your words, the less people are actually attaching on to charitable giving as a way of life. Again, why we wish in, in going back to your original question, why my wish is for financial literacy donor education, because we know people will act this way if empowered to, to do so, and why user experience focused on the donor's interests in creating change is more important than focusing on what the charities need money for. Yeah, it's funny. It's like the current paradigm is focused on the just nag them to give you a dollar to go away, right? Like that's that's almost it versus, okay, I haven't been fatigued for all this stuff that's been happening, but I want to do something. Now I can think about it, right? Like I often wonder like what the, you, know, you, you kind of nail it there. It's like, yeah, it's, it's, actually, it's actually a less effective paradigm than what we had before. And it's, uh, uh, you know, if we imagine a world where everybody had to do an effort to raise charity, raise money for a central, a central bank of charitable giving, and then disperse that out from one central bank, we would not be in the fundraising paradigm. We would not be right. doing that. So the other point you raised, Jason, is that like, so the strong fundraisers win, and that is undoubtedly oh, yeah. true. Today, 80% of donations being made are going to 1% of charities, which is up just over the last five years from about 60% of donations were going to 1% of charities about five or six years ago. So the other yeah. downside of the fundraising paradigm, the biggest downside is it doesn't empower the donor to really get engaged with what they care about. And it becomes yeah. this fatiguing, almost like, oh, I have to do it just to feel good thing, which is not yeah. sustainable. The, the second it, thing is that the big people who have the big charities who have spend the most on fundraising get all the money and the other 99% of charities are just depending on on volunteer and true a different yeah. form of true benevolence and it's just not a level playing field yeah and in fairness i mean there is i think concentration at some levels not a bad thing because you do have some causes that are what i'll say objectively more worthy or more cost more cost heavy than others Right. Like I've got a soft spot in my heart for sick kids in Toronto and I've, I've done some some help with their, especially on the insurance side. And, you know, every time they run into an obstacle, I'm like or they're like they're like, oh, we know we need, you're doing a lot for us. Can we, can, you know, we can't just come to you all the time. Like who says no to you people? Whoever yeah. says no to sick kids charitable foundation. Like I like I'm pretty sure there's a there's a circle of hell that Dante talked about where, where that's where people go. Anyway, so we spent a lot of time on question one. Let's go to question yeah. two. Question two. What has been the biggest challenge again the company to where it is today? Oh man, I would hate to go back and reference question my answer to question one, but I mean the difference between the delta between how naturally people care about something changing and wanting wanting to get involved in an organization like ours, and where their fluency is and their experience level is with regard to how charitable giving works and and what the opportunities are and even what a donor advice fund is. So I would say the biggest challenge with team members. We have a lot of very talented team members, but they don't come from the charity market. The biggest challenge with financial advisors and ultimately the biggest challenge with donors is just understanding that there are approaches to charitable giving where they themselves are empowered to have full agency over what they do and explaining that and getting people up to speed on that and moving them away from just being asked to make donations all the time from these fundraising charities is, I think, the biggest barrier to what we're doing, even though we're starting to really overcome it now that we're eight or nine, 10 years into what we're doing. Well, I was just going to say, it's an interesting question. I've never really considered it and trying to come up with a, a good answer that's reflective of my experience of being out there. I think uh, I referenced earlier the idea that the knowledge of philanthropy in general and donor advice funds specifically with financial advisors is, let's call it low, but increasing. And so we have what we believe is a really great product and a really great service but I'm out there speaking with people who don't know that they need it yet. And so there's a, uh, there's a certain level of education required beyond finding the advisors who do get it, obviously. And there are a lot of them out there for sure. And then they recognize the value of what we're talking about. But, but uh, getting the ones up to speed, or at least getting to them to the point where they, were, they will consider the potentially important question that, yeah, maybe I should be adding philanthropy to my services and speaking to my clients' uh, charitable uh, intentions. So a lot of education, uh, that's a challenge, but it's also what makes the job so much fun. Yeah, it's interesting. I think um, one, one interesting pushback I've gotten is that like, well, it's one of the, they don't want to say no to all their co If they do a big chunk on their own, 
they still got to say no to all these different fundraisers, right? Especially my response is I tell the story of T. Boone Pickens, who, um, for those of you who know him, he's, a, um, he's one of the, the original corporate raiders back in the day and a well-known oil man. But he was approached about the giving pledge where you basically give up half of your, they were asking billionaires to give up half of their wealth on death. And uh, when, they, when they asked them about to do that, he just laughed and said, uh, you, need to, you need to do some catching up. And he had already over his lifetime given away more than 50% of what he had made. Right. So it's like, maybe you catch up to my level of giving before you do anything else. Right. And it's like, yeah, if people are like, why won't you donate, donate 25 to this cause donate thousands of dollars over there, man. Like I've, I've chosen my horse in this race and congratulations. You're, you're, you're biking from here to here. And I support that, but I made my call. Like that's what matters to me. What you're referring to is the paradigm we want to see come about, which is where donors are involved with charity. And so when they say no to someone asking, it's not no, and I don't give any at all. It's no, thanks for asking. And thanks even for riding your bike from here to who knows where. But I'm really involved over here, and this is where I'm focused, and yeah. this is what I'm doing. You know, what we see, unfortunately, in this more fundraising-driven paradigm is where people aren't doing something on their own. And so when they're asked, they're almost saying yes out of obligation and or want to be seen to be doing something, period, rather than want to be seen to be doing something about what they themselves care about, which is the sustainable thing. I mean, we force everyone to play basketball. I think there'd be less athletes in the world than if you just said, look, be active and play what you want. You know, it's funny. I I fell completely into that paradigm for a long time in my life where it was my justification was I'm going to give heavy to these organizations. Like I would be like near the top of one of their donor lists uh, for every friend who did anything. And they're like, wow, it's generous. I'm like, look, man, I'm giving you money. So I don't have to do these things. Like, like that's the, that was part of it. Right. Like that was, that was my mindset. But again, it was, it was letting, you know, my friends and and colleagues, like whatever, whether they were doing because they supported that charity or whether they were doing it because they wanted to do the event because it was a challenge and Hey, it's for the charity. I was letting them determine where it was going. And that's not necessarily wouldn't necessarily be where I would cut a check to if I had the exact, I mean, don't get me wrong. These are all worthy causes, but maybe there's something closer to my heart. Last question for you. What excites you the most about what it is you're working on? What keeps you getting up every day to basically fight the good fight? Jason, I'll I'll start there. We have three beliefs at Charitable Impact. The first is that everyone has something they want to create change for in the world. The second is everyone has something to give towards that, whether it's their time, their talent, or their their treasure, their money. And the third is that when you give something, you get something in return. If you can subscribe to those three benefits, then what you require in order to manage your, your, your charitable giving and your giving contributions is a donor advised fund. So we want to see an empowered base of donors who are become more educated and developed with with regard to the art and science of giving over their lifetime. And the tool for that is unquestionably, in my mind, the donor advised fund. So we are building an organization, we have business interests, we have business concerns, but ultimately we're driven by the mission to provide the resources to people to be able to act on what it is they care about most. And uh, I believe in that very, very firmly. I believe it's a form of what Peter Thiel refers to in his more recent book about, you know, a a business based on human truth, this truth of generosity. And uh, that excites me. And that gets me up and out of bed in the morning and helps me overcome the manifold challenges in building an organization like ours at Charitable Impact which again, I believe is servicing a human truth, but dealing in a product that's known as a donor advised fund, which is really not well known yet in society, even though it's growing. If I could go back 200 years and meet the people who sort of founded the banking institutions of the world, you know, I'd love to learn from them on how they shifted people from storing their net worth in cattle and jewelry and stuffing things in their mattress towards having an administered, governed bank account for their funding. And unfortunately, um, I'm so focused on the donor advice fund that I haven't yet built the time machine. Fair enough. Awesome. So, uh, and Michael, your, your answer. I think my answer to that would be the potential. You know, in our conversation today, we've touched on some of the challenges of the, the state of charity today in Canada. We've touched on some of the reasons why we think a donor advice fund is a good tool to combat those. And I've also mentioned the challenge of educating people that I work with to get involved. And so until every Canadian has a donor advice fund and until every Canadian financial advisor is actively working with their clients and helping them enhance their giving, uh, I've got work to do. And that gets me up in the morning and gets me totally excited. It's just such a, a massive potential. Never mind stopping to think for a minute what the world would look like 
not if, but when we accomplish that, that's phenomenal. But uh, you know, I haven't got time to think about that yet. I've just got to figure out how to how to help uh, move the bar and keep inching forward, and that's the thrilling. Well, I mean, it's um, it's a good thing about <laughs> about working in, the, in any form of the charitable sector. There's always purpose to what you're doing, right? And larger purpose. Anyway, gentlemen, I thank you both for your time. Uh, I encourage everybody to check out your website and every advisor to do this kind of thinking because, frankly, when your client cares about the business, the reviews become not just about money going in and out of RSPs, TFSAs, and the other and RESPs, but also the charitable account, right? And I think that's a that's a powerful relationship builder and I've used it in a handful of occasions. So thank you, keep up the good work. Thanks Jason. Jason thank you for Thanks. having us. So that was my interview with John Bromley and Michael Todd of Charitable Impact. I hope you enjoyed that. And if you're charitably minded, I hope you take the time to check out their website. And if you do deal with, and if you're client facing, to have those worthy conversations with clients about charity itself and how it can be enabled. And with that, as always, this has been Fintech Impact. If you enjoy this podcast, please leave a review on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever it is you get your podcasts. Until next time, take care. This podcast was brought to you by Woodgate Financial, an award-winning financial planning firm catering to high net worth individuals and their families. To learn more, go to woodgate.com. You can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, and Google Play, or find more episodes at Jason